signed into the call. So my name is Babs. Um, I'm the recruitment officer for the Warwick IFP. That's the Warwick International Foundation Program. And the aim of this session is kind of to help students understand how we help them prepare to study at a top 10 UK university that's either Warwick or any other university. Um, so I'm happy for us to start. So what I'll do first is kind of give you an outline. We're going to speak a bit about the University of Warwick so you can get an understanding of how good the university is. Um, Warwick IFP students are actually treated the same as undergraduate students. So it's important that you look not just at the foundation program, but you look at the university as a whole, as the reputation of the university and um, the rankings of the university will affect your degree when you progress into Warwick or if um, you choose to go and enter into an undergraduate elsewhere. So you have an understanding of the meaning of Warwick and the name um, within the UK and also outside of the UK. Then after that, I'm going to give you an overview of the Warwick IFP. So we'll be looking at the structure, um, how progression works into the undergraduate degrees. Um, we'll also be looking at entry requirements and application process. And then finally, we'll be doing a question and answer session afterwards. So first things first, um, we're called the University of Warwick, but we're not actually located in the town of Warwick. We're actually located in the city of Coventry. This is quite brilliant for students because Coventry is actually the 10th biggest city in the United Kingdom. And we're right next door to Birmingham, which is the second biggest city in the UK. So London would be the first biggest city. So Birmingham is about 20 minutes, 25 minutes on the fast train. We're also near Birmingham Airport. That means students are able to fly to Birmingham and get a quick taxi or Uber straight onto campus. Um, then you've also got the city of Coventry itself, which um, is populated by students. 6% um, of the population of Coventry is students, and Coventry is based within the city centre, the University of Coventry, while we're on the southeast. So we're kind of on the outskirts, which means students have a city life and a quiet country life as well, which is really good. Then we're also next to historic towns such as Stratford upon Avon, which is the home of Shakespeare, and then Leamington Spa, where students can go and live. Um, students typically can live in Kenilworth, Warwick, Leamington, Spa, or Coventry, or even Birmingham when they progress into their second and third year of the university. That's something for you to know. So this kind of gives you some images. So this is the, the town of Warwick. It's quite historic, that's Warwick Castle. Then this is Cathedral um, in Coventry within the city centre. Um, Coventry is a mixture of modern and a bit of old. And then you've got Leamington Spa, which is more affluent. So that's where our students who like more of the chic um, luxury lifestyle, the more shopping, and you've got lots more restaurants, it's a bit more up and coming, that's Leamington Spa. So this is the university main campus, it's an aerial image of the main campus. So if you're not already aware, the University of Warwick is split into three campuses. So that's Gibbet Hill campus, main campus and Westwood campus. The Warwick International Foundation, our building is based on Westwood campus, however students have classes across main campus and Westwood. So that means you have access to the whole of the university. One of the great things is everything you're seeing there is university um, buildings or it's accommodation or it's sports facilities around the main campus. So you have areas of large space, you've got lakes and um, rivers running across campus as well as your classes. So you can get that mixture of lifestyles instead of being located, for example, just in the city where you kind of got just buildings around. You. So this is good for students and also for like mental health and just time to relax and meet students. It also makes it easier to navigate in situations or in times such as this because students would be located in accommodation which are near to you so you can socialise even when sometimes restrictions are put in place on, on a global level. So in terms of students, we have around about 27,278 students and of that number, almost 10,000 are international. Then we have um, 6,294 staff and that's spread across all the three campuses that I mentioned. So the university itself is actually ranked eighth currently regarding rankings and then we're 10th and 11th in the times and also the complete university guide. So when it comes to University of Warwick, we consistently rank within the top 10 um, UK universities since rankings began. So that means that the reputation for Warwick is um, very strong within the United Kingdom. So that's really important for students who may be looking to progress from the foundation into other degree programs. I'll explain how that works in a little bit, but that's something that you want to know as well. So I'm sure some of you have already checked out websites such as Imperial where they mention 
um, the Warwick Foundation um, of universities such as UCL also accept Warwick. So we're actually accepted by um, all UK universities, which is really important for students. So teaching quality is very important. And then not just on um, a UK level, on a global level, our reputation is further increasing. So we're currently 62nd in the QS university rankings and 77th in the Times Higher edu um, Education World University rankings. So we're ranked within the top 100 in the world, which is very important for when you finish your foundation and even finish your degree go into the world of work, whether you stay in the UK or you go internationally. And then what you're seeing is how we split up um, our academic faculties. So subject areas are generally split up in arts, sciences and social sciences. We're more of a traditional university. So we don't have a lot of modern subjects such as uh, marketing, digital marketing. Those wouldn't be subject areas on the undergraduate scale that you're looking at. So for IFP students, this is important. Um, so our IFP streams help students go into these different faculty areas. So you may find that a number of streams allow students to go into social science based courses and a number of streams allow students to go into different science courses and different arts courses. So we've picked out the key names that students are aware of when it comes to degrees like engineering, life sciences, mathematics, um, physics. Those would be like key areas that you'd find. And then same with the Warwick Business School has a number of business related degree programs, but it's in our social science faculty. Um, so we also have this opportunity for cross faculty studies. So that's when you can mix either liberal arts or global sustainable development with an arts related degree or science related degree or social science related degree. Something to be aware of. So when it comes onto the campus that I showed you earlier, so students, when they're on campus, they have access to 65 different sports clubs. That varies from mixed martial arts to horse riding. We've also got swimming club. We've obviously got football, rugby. Um, those are all key sports here. And um, we've got running clubs. So we've got 65 different sports clubs. Then we've got 25 societies. And those can be cultural societies, interest societies as well. And students have access to all of that as an IFP student. Then we have over 8,000 employment and volunteering opportunities on campus, which can be quite important for students to build their skill level and um, help them build their CV. So if you're looking now, um, one thing that the pandemic has helped um, employers realize is that they want skilled staff, staff that have the ability to do a number of different things. So you can do that practically through volunteering experience and then employment through like placements once you're on your program as well. And then this is all the different support teams that we have available to students as well. So you've got an accommodations team, you've got a welcome team, a residential life team. So that's the team that helps students when they live in accommodation. So they would be helping you when you get locked out of your room, you're having issues with your flatmates, those types of areas. We've got an international office and that office pretty much helps students with the key issues that international students can face when they come and study in the UK. So you'd speak with them depending on what your issue is. Then you've obviously got the library, which is accessible on um, in person and then also online. So students don't always have to be on campus to have access. The Students' Union. Um, the Students' Union is pretty much the main hub for all the facilities that are relating to students. So you'd find that the accommodations team would be in the Students' Union. You'd also have a lot of things like um, a lot of our shops. Um, so we have banks, all of that's in the Students' Union, our Opportunity Hub, it's all in the Students' Union. And then we've got the Student Advice Centre as well, that's, again, where you're getting advice, that's all within the Students' Union. We've got an Art Centre, a Music Centre, Sports Centre and Health Centre. Health Centre is important for students as that's on campus and that's where you sign up for the doctor. So if you're, it's pretty much one of the main things we get you to do within the first two weeks of being a student at the university. You sign up for a doctor so that if you get ill at any point, you're able to see them. Um, which is very important, especially um, students tend to get the flu and you don't want to be sick at any point during your study. And then we have the well-being and support, and that's support in terms of any like mental health issues that you may start to face. So if you want to find support groups to help you with transitioning into the UK, um, if you want to find support groups obviously outside of what we're providing on the IFP, and then chaplaincies relating to different religious groups so they will be able to link you to where to go and worship depending on your denomination and religion which is really important then estates and security monitor all three campuses and they look at the security of the university and make sure that 
students have access to buildings when they get locked out or when they need help locating a certain area, they'll be able to help them and they just monitor that pretty much it's mainly students and staff on campus as well. Then uni temps is where you'd be joining if you were to go into work on campus and then obviously student opportunities um, is linked with uni temps as they advertise um, student job and volunteer opportunity placements. So we do have a lot of different areas available as part of the overall university. So what you're seeing there is actually a picture of our new sports and wellness hub. So that one has six squash courts, a um, 15 meter climbing wall. We have a 25 meter meter swimming pool, we have a gym facilities, all of this is available to students at different price plans. And then we also have the art centre, so it's one of the largest art centres outside of London, and students have the ability to get discounted prices to visit any of the art galleries. We have three cinema screens within there. Those cinema screens also show um, new releases, so you can just do it all on campus. We have theatre shows as well. So we've got two theatres and we've also got a studio on campus as well. So students can get culture while on campus and pretty much a stone's throw from their accommodation. And this is also great because if you're not aware, um, Warwick um, Coventry has been voted the City of Culture for 2021. It started in May and it's going to run along until next year, May. That means a lot of cultural events will be happening throughout the city and the art centre is a focal point as well. So students have all of that access. So we do get a lot of famous comedians and um, different shows. They all come onto campus that students have access to. Then we've got an art building. So if you remember at the beginning, I showed you the different faculties. So with the arts faculty, this is a new building where all most of, I think seven of the faculties, seven of the departments from the arts faculty will be um, housed within the arts building so it makes it easier for students and then the building is more focused in one area and then what you're looking at is just an illustrated picture of the aerial shot I showed you at the beginning so you've got all the buildings that I mentioned and then if you notice that they're purple buildings along the outside so that's all student accommodation again this is just a small snapshot of some of the student accommodation as we also have it around um, Westwood campus. As a student um, at the university, you have access to on-campus and off-campus accommodation. Typically, students would be choosing to be on in accommodation for their foundation program as well as their first year. Then they want to get more independent when it comes to their second and third year and you start to live with your friends. You tend to live, as I mentioned, in Leamington, Warwick, Kenilworth or just other areas of Coventry. And all this accommodation prices are varying. So students can pay up to £75 a week all the way up until £200 a week. It all depends on your budget and what you're looking to um, find. So our accommodation is a shared accommodation. That means that students will be having a flat with either eight to 12 other students within that flat. Students have their own private bedroom. Um, they have their own, uh, they can either choose to have their own bathroom, which is connected to their bedroom and ensuite or they can choose to share a bathroom. A shared bathroom comes at a cheaper cost. And then outside of your room in your bathroom area, you've then got a shared living room. So that means everyone else who's got rooms in your flat would be sharing the living room and would also share the kitchen. And this is mainly because at the university, we're looking to help students socialize and you'd also be um, looking to be housed with students who are on the undergraduate program. So that means that IFP students integrate fully into the university. They don't just live with IFP students. However, if you are under 16, um, under 18, sorry, you would live in a special accommodation with other under 18 students, and that's for safeguarding purposes. So just to make sure that you're safe and you're not being influenced by our over 18 students who are considered adults in the UK. So that's just something to be aware of. And all of this um, is available for the foundation year and the second year, I'm um, sorry, and the first year technically of the undergraduate, which would be your second year at Warwick, should you choose to stay. So that kind of gives you a bit more information about the University of Warwick. And then when it comes to accommodation, we don't do it on a first come first serve basis. How it works is all the students have um, an accommodation deadline. So once the application's open, every student applies, both foundation and undergraduate. Then when the deadline closes, the university will then allocate students into apartments based on the choices they've made in their application forms for accommodation. So just to be aware that it's 
something that students tend to think about once they have received their offer and they have an idea of whether they're definitely joining um, the University of Warwick. So that's the main Warwick information about facilities, everything you get as a Warwick student um, outside of the foundation program. And then now I'll discuss more about the foundation. So if you're new to foundations or you're just new to the idea of the, um, going to university in the UK, there are typically three main ways that students would be going, um, would be looking to enter into an undergraduate course um, in the UK. It's either you're studying um, a UK and international course equivalent to A-levels or IB. You typically have studied that for two years. That would allow a student for direct entry into an undergraduate degree. You've either completed some level of a local qualification. So for example, um, APs, SATs, or just a different qualification from a different country, even though you may have studied it within Indonesia, that would allow you to go into um, directly into first year of an undergraduate degree, or you've currently completed um, high school, you're completing a qualification that doesn't allow direct entry. And that would typically be the local Indi um, Indonesian high school that would need you to complete a bridging program. So that's completing a pathway program that bridges the gap between your high school education and the university level. So that's usually a one year foundation program you take that to be able to enter in. So those are the three main ways that you find students entering in the UK. So when you're looking at illustrated, um, A-levels and IB and the Warwick IFP, so these foundations are all considered at the same level, therefore you can enter into a degree. So why the Warwick IFP? So we're actually one of the lo um, longest running foundation programs in the UK. We've actually been running since 1983. So it's been a very, very long time. We're delivered at the University of Warwick by Warwick Academics. So we don't have an external team doing this. It's all done on campus by university. We also have progression routes into most of the Warwick uh, University's degree programmes as well. And then we're considered by all UK universities. That's including UCL, LSD, Oxford, Cambridge, Manchester, Bristol, Sheffield, Leeds, I'm trying to think, Durham, Lancaster, that's where most of our students want to go to, and then here's one as well. We also have a tailored English provision, which I'll explain a bit more to you um, as we go through, and that's grouped by your IELTS score. Then we've got an inquiring research skill, which is quite unique, and then we've got 10 different academic streams. So when you're looking at our pathway, these are the 10 pathways students have. You've got business, finance, mathematics and statistics, economics, computer science, engineering, biological sciences and psychology, social science, law and politics, arts and humanities. So students would choose one of these streams to be able to then progress into a degree that's, in, that's related to that stream. So you may find that some degree programs will allow students to progress into um, multiple similar degrees. So for example, a business management student can progress into business like management degrees and they can in some cases progress into other social science related degrees because they're technically within the social science faculty. I'll break that down a little bit more for you guys so it makes a bit more sense but you have quite a number of programs. So the structure for the IFP it's split up into your academic discipline module and then an acquiring research skills module and then you've got an academic English module. So how that looks for students is your academic discipline module, you're typically going to have three to five academic modules. So those modules are either full course modules or half course modules. And by that, I mean, you're either taking that module throughout the whole year of the foundation as a full course, or you study that module per term. And then those modules will be giving you that foundational understanding that's relevant to your degree study. So if you're doing business management, you're doing modules that are relevant to the business management undergraduate degree program at Warwick and other universities. So that means you'd be looking at marketing, um, business law, you'd be looking at mathematics and business, obviously looking at the global economy as an area. Um, and then you've also got organizational behavior. So if you were to look at an undergraduate degree of another university and even at Warwick, you'll see that those modules relate to what's taught on an undergraduate level. And all of this teaching is divided in lectures, seminars and tutorials. So lectures will typically be largely based. So that's when all the students on the stream would join together. 
Then your seminars and tutorials is when we have smaller um, groups of students. So just so you're aware, our overall size, we try and have maybe three groups within the business management, in some cases, four groups, and the maximum size of students in those groups would be 15 students per group. So we don't um, allow a lot of students onto the programme, so it's important that students start looking about where they're looking to go and also that they're on the right stream. Students in our science courses would be looking at laboratory sessions for those students, and then all of the programmes are taught by subject specialists. What that means is that um, they've either been in the industry or they've been teaching that course area um, for a very long time, and also either in universities um, across or they teach also on the undergraduate programme. And one thing worth noting as well is that when it comes to our academic modules, we discuss all of these with the undergraduate teams and we also discuss them with some um, external universities as well to make sure that our students are learning the relevant information. So for different modules, they have asked us to teach specific things for students. And we also make sure that this helps students with interdisciplinary um, learning. What that means is that you're learning across a number of different academic disciplines, even though you're learning business. So that's really important for students as that's what happens when you join your undergraduate degree. So another area, so as I said, you've got your four to five academic discipline modules, sorry, three to five academic discipline modules. Then you have an inquiry and research skills module added on. And this is where students are putting their skills into practice. The title kind of gives you a clear idea. It's where you're learning better inquiry skills, research skills, um, analysis skills. And again, they all relate to your chosen discipline. So if you're doing arts and humanities, you're doing art inquiry and research for arts and humanities, and you're looking at how to think differently, engage with research differently in relation to your chosen IFP stream. All of this will be accumulating um, in an assessed poster competition at the end. And this is all done typically um, at the term three is when you do your assessed competition. So unlike your academic discipline modules, your inquiry and research skills is a full course module. So you're studying that module throughout the whole foundation. So that's a one year module. Then you've got your academic English module. And this is, it's very important that I outline that this is not where you be learning English. You will take your IELTS and your IELTS should put you at the right level that you'd be able to join the foundation. What you're doing here is you're developing your English skills in relation to your chosen discipline. So that's looking at the academic side. So how do you look at writing presentation? How do you look at debates, discussion, academic writing, um, lab reports? So it's looking at English in more depth, not just in um, learning English. And one of the great things about this module is that Students can use this module to then, um, um, in lieu of IELTS, so you could use this module as part of your progression. So instead of taking another IELTS, we'll use the grade for this module, which we've already been on your um, undergraduate offer. So that's good for a lot of students. And then while on the program, so this is while on, at, while as a Warwick IFP student, you have access to a personal tutor. Um, your personal tutor is pretty much your uh, main contact for support. So with your tutor, they'll help when we start looking at your undergraduate applications. Um, they'll meet up with you to talk about how you're finding your workload. If any of your other module leaders have any worries, your personal tutor will be informed and they can contact you and you can start working on a plan to help you to pass the IFP better. Um, your personal tutor also has a number of other tutees. Um, that means he has other students who they work with who are on the IFP and then you form a personal teacher group. So that means you're able to meet students from different IFP streams as well through the teacher group. We also have a school counsellor who I'll explain a bit more about, but she's the one who's going to help you with your undergraduate progression. Um, so you'd be contacting her quite a lot and so will your personal tutor while you're on the programme to make sure that you are going to progress into the degrees and the universities that you want to. We also have a staff to student liaison committee. And essentially this is a committee where each academic stream would nominate one student as their representative. That representative would be meeting with staff on the programme and you would be speaking with those staff and 
discussing issues that students have that they've raised for you to, to tell the staff. And then you'd look at ways of um, upgrading the program and helping students either for the year that you're currently in, or if it's something that we can't upgrade straight away, it would be for the students coming in the IFP after you. So that's a really important program, um, really important component, because it means that your voices will be heard and you um, have an influence on the IFP and how you're being taught. And then what I've got here is an illustration of how it looks for the modules for the business management. So as I said before, you're gonna be studying four to five academic discipline modules. In this case, students who take the business management IFP, they take five academic modules. Um, from those five academic modules, I've got long bars and four, um, small bars. Small bars mean it's a half course module, a long bar means it's a full course module. So a full course module would be the global economy. This would run throughout your whole academic year. So the whole year of the IFP, you study global economy. And then for organizational behavior, this would be taught per term. So you may find that you've got global economy, organizational behavior and business law in term one. And then you've also got to remember that you'd also have inquiry and research skills in term one as part of your modules, same with the English for academic purposes, as those two modules run all year round. So that means per term, you'd be studying five modules per term. And when I speak about terms, if you're not already aware, so with the University of Warwick, we follow the undergraduate calendar with a slight variation in holidays. That means we follow a three term system. That means term one, is September till December. Term two is January till March. Term three is April till June, typically getting your results at the end of June or the first week of July. So that's a three term system. Students are typically learning most of their academic content in term one and term two. And term three is there to wrap up any modules that have run longer, as well as for revision purposes before any final exams. So how you'd be getting your grades once you've finished, everything um, is kind of, it's a compilation of all of the module grades added together to find an overall average. So you would get an overall average of, for example, 76%, but you'd also get individual scores for each module that you take. So you may get 76% overall, but you'd also be able to see that you've got 72 in business law, 65 in organizational behavior, for example. So you'd see all of that. And then this is important in relation to your progression. So I've put an example here um, about progression. So for students who are in the business management IFP to go into the management degree at the University of Warwick, they would need to achieve an overall average of 70% in the IF, business management IFP to then progress into Warwick. So you can see how you'd be able to work your percentages out. So this happens for every, every IFP stream and the way the percentages works would vary. So one of the most important things is we have over 70 different courses in the University of Warwick that students on our IFP can join. So when you actually enroll as a student, you would have access to our um, progression database. So once you're a student, you get access to every single degree option that's available in your stream, and it will outline exactly the percentage you need um, to achieve in your overall percentage and your modulus percentage, if there is one at all, and then any English language also requirements. That would all be within that screen that you would have access to all year round. Unfortunately, we can't give it to students before they join. But typically, students are needing overalls of 70 for most of our courses. That's the general average. Um, some courses may ask for an overall average of 80 or 85. Some also ask for overall averages of 60 um, to 65. So just to give you an idea of 70 being the main score that students are asked. So what you're seeing here is just, it's also in our prospectus if you haven't seen it, but this is an outline of our most popular undergraduate courses that students apply for. And then you're looking at the different IFP streams that would allow a student to go into that degree course. So I know that a lot of students, for example, 
may want to study um, accounting and finance. So they're not sure whether they take the finance IFP or can they take a different IFP. So if you can see from here, students can actually take finance or economics in order to join accounting and finance as a degree program at the University of Warwick. However, for example, for economics, students can take finance, mathematics and statistics, economics, or even um, computer science, and they would all allow you to enter into the economics degree program. This is actually because of the modules that students study. So you notice that students who study mathematics and statistics, economics and computer science have similar maths-based modules. Therefore, they go into an economic degree. So the variation is different. So it's very important that um, before you join the IFP program, you have an idea of which degree it is that you want to study. So that's very important. You know more so about the degree, not the IFP stream, because the degree is what's most important. Then we'll help you work backwards to make sure you're on the right stream for the degree that you want in Warwick or anywhere else. So that's very important. So once you know what degree you want, we'll advise you on which stream works best for you. Some of them are quite um, obvious. For example, if you want to study a law or politics related degree, then you'd obviously be in the law and politics IFP. It all depends on, um, yeah, it all depends really on what you want to study. So what you're then getting from the course. So for your progression, all IFP students are guaranteed a conditional offer into the University of Warwick's undergraduate program. What that means is while on the IFP will help you apply for an undergraduate um, degree. So our in-house school counselor, who's our education and liaison officer, she deals with all of your advice and guidance in relation to your undergraduate studies. So we'll help you apply through the system called UCAS. That's the pretty much the university system used by all universities. We'll help you gather your references um, within your term one, work on your personal statements. Um, during your term one, you'll also be assessed. Um, those assessments will be mock assessments and then there'll be formal assessments. Those predicted grades that we get from all of these assessments would be used in your UCAS application, which would need to be submitted by the 15th of January. And when you're applying through UCAS, you get five choices. So usually students would make choice number one, the University of Warwick, then you have four other universities you can choose. And those universities could be two other high ranking universities and then two middle universities um, so that you'd be able to get all your offers. Then once you've got all your offers, typically after March, you would then make your firm choice. That's your number one choice and your insurance, which is your number two choice. Then you'd reject your remaining three offers. Then you'd work on the IFP to make sure you're making the grades for your number one choice. And then you'd pick whichever university if you choose thereafter. So Warwick IFP students do not, they don't have to go to the University of Warwick. We're happy for them to go elsewhere and we help them with that process. And then it all depends on what you're choosing. So just a little bit more about then assessments and how we're grading you on the program. So we work on a system of you gaining the cumulative grades. So that means we're not looking at you having one final exam at the end of the program. So each term, you may have a number of assessments which are either formal, as I was saying, or informal. So the mock assessments to give you an idea of how you're doing, and then you'd have final assessments. And by assessments, these all vary, again, depending on which module you're studying and um, which academic teacher you have. So it may be that you, within term one, you may have 10% of your grade is going to come from a presentation, which is a group presentation. Then you may have 30% of your grade is going to come from um, an essay. So within term one, you may have, you have the ability to have gained 40% of your overall grade for your IFP. Then in term two, you'd have more assessments. So you may find that your lecturer wants to give you a 20%, um, another essay, for example, for 20%. And then in term three, you're doing revision. So at the end of the program, you then just have one exam left. And at that point, that's when you'd be looking at 
gaining the remaining the remaining percentages. So it all varies. So all the assessments are different. So it may be lab reports, essays, um, group projects, individual projects, group presentation, individual presentations. It, that all varies depending on which stream you're on. And it also changes term by term. So students currently now, they're going into exam week, but you go into exam week knowing how you're doing and what you need to achieve in your final exams. So we have a grade calculator that helps students know they need to achieve a minimum of a particular grade in order to meet the progression goal that they're working towards. And we help students throughout the whole process. The reason you're having the mock exams and the mock tests is to see whether you're understanding the information. And if you're not, we're able to put steps in place where you can attend um, additional uh, classes where you're learning some of the information and you're getting help from your tutor so that you can catch up and gain and gain as much as you can from the program and therefore meet your progression grades. So as I mentioned before earlier, you're fully integrated into the University of Warwick campus. So that's student life, all the facilities as undergraduate students. And then you've obviously widely accepted by all other UK universities, as I mentioned. So the delivery of the programme, so as I said, we follow the academic calendar for undergraduate students, so that's September to June with additional holidays. Our students will participate in the University Welcome Week, which means from September 27th, um, this year you'll be doing University Welcome Week, then you typically have an IFP Welcome Week after, then your academic teaching will start. So you'd be then fully enrolled in the programme, and then you'd be having four hours per week of taught time per academic module. So as I said, you'd have three to five academic modules. So you'd be having four hours per week per module. And then you'd be having around about 21 hours of scheduled contact time. That's time with your lectures. That's face-to-face -face time typically per week. Then you've got that streamlined English um, classes and tuition. Then it's delivered across campus. And by across campus, I mean Westwood campus and central campus. And then you'd also got the on-campus residential accommodation for your IFP and undergraduate. So then who are we looking for when it comes to the IFP? So the IFP is not a course for students who've missed the grades required for undergraduate degree study. So if you wanted to go to one of the university's undergraduate degrees because you've taken A-levels or IB diploma, and you missed the grade, you wouldn't be able to join the IFP. So we're seeking essentially the best um, candidates who have the potential to succeed on Warwick's world-class degrees. So the entry requirement for students from Indonesia would be to um, complete the certificate of graduation from secondary school with 80% overall in the final year. So we're looking for top class students. Um, I will note that the admissions team may be able to look at applications from students who receive, for example, 79% or 78%. So if you're just a little bit off the 80% um, before submitting an application, you can speak to the team at IBEX and they can contact us to review your um, transcript before submitting the application. We do accept other qualifications. So that's um, IGCSEs, for example, we will accept those in AS levels. So if you're an IGCSE student, you'd be looking at achieving um, four A's in your IGCSEs and the remaining subjects at grade B. Again, if you have four A's and all of your subjects are B apart from one, which may be a C, we would look at your application before you submitted it just to see what grade, um, what subject is that grade C, and then we may be able to make an assessment on your grades on whether or not you'd still be able to apply. So when it comes to the application process, it's done directly through our website and the IBEX team can do that for students. And you'd be applying um, with your most recent school transcript. So I know that most schools are due to close, close soon, so you can use your final transcript or if you have your term one transcript already ready, you can use that. And then you'd have a personal statement. And this personal statement is slightly different um, to what you may see around. We ask students to complete three specific questions, which are listed on our website. And they have to complete those three questions at 200 words per question. So that's 600 words overall. And then we'd be able to either 
um, issue you with a conditional offer, or we may ask you for additional information, which may be attending um, an interview. So it could be a mass interview, for example, or just to get further information on your background if your personal statement doesn't clarify everything for us. I'd say it's important to note if you're looking to apply for a computer science program, you would be asked to do an online computer science test. We call that a computational thinking test. Um, students, unfortunately, we wouldn't give you, um, you wouldn't be revising for this test. It's to just look at your ability to understand patterns. Um, it's a quick 20 minute test where you answer six questions. And then depending on that, you'd be then able to move on to the next step of receiving that conditional offer. The conditional offer typically states we need your final grades and then we'd also state you need a UKVI IELTS with um, the grade listed on the offer. Once you provide, um, also to pay a £2,000 deposit to secure your place. So once you've um, accepted your offer and paid the deposit, you can move on to an unconditional offer and then we'd also start your visa process. So for anyone looking to apply now, you would have um, until the 31st of July um, to apply for the Warwick IFB programme. And then in terms of those additional documents that I mentioned of the IELTS um, and your final transcripts, you'd have until the 13th of August to submit those alongside your um, deposit to, to secure your place. But the sooner you can do that, it's always the better. As I said, we do limit group sizes. So some streams can get fuller quicker than others, which is worth noting. And then now, perfect time for our um, question and answer session. So if you have any general inquiries, you're free to email the IFP team at ifp at warwick.ac.uk. You can email myself, um, Babon Gilling Duwenny at warwick.ac.uk, or you can check out our website. But that's pretty much the main information for the IFP. If there are any areas that I stepped over, please let me know when it comes into the IFP. Yes, thank you, Babs, for so, the uh, information. So, mungkin buat rekan-rekan yang ada di webinar ini, ada yang ingin ditanyakan ke Ms. Babs langsung? Ada yang ingin nanya soal uh, suasana di Warwick saat ini, keadaan COVID atau atau apapun yang berhubungan dengan uh, Warwick Foundation, Miss Babs, uh, mumpung Miss Babsnya sedang ada, jadi kita bisa tanya langsung. I think they 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 are still shy, Babs. <laughs> so they're still quiet. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I know that one question that we do get asked a lot about is obviously this current uh, pandemic that's happening. So with COVID-19, how does that affect September studies? Um, will the program be online? Students do ask these questions. So the program is set to run for September 21. We're looking at blended learning for term one. So by blended le learning, we mean that you would have face-to-face -face classes that would typically be your seminars and tutorials, which are much smaller. And then you'd have some online components, which may end up being your lectures where we'd have more students um, in place. That's how it'd be looking. So you would still need to travel to the UK and live on campus um, as a normal university student. But for your larger group sessions, they would likely be online. And then your smaller sessions would be face-to-face. So that's how term one would work. And then the hope is that for term two, we can go back to being completely face-to-face. -face. So that's just something for students to be aware of. Um, if you haven't been watching the news, or if you have, you'll be aware that the UK government is still um, um, easing lockdown measures over the last few months. So that means that nothing has been confirmed um, on what the rules are for students who travel in, in September. The likelihood is that students who travel in September wouldn't be subject to any quarantine rules and that's because the government is looking to remove all rules in the UK by August or uh, well, really by July but by August at least everything should be going back to normal for us here so you'd be able to travel in um, as you would have before the pandemic hit. 
Okay, that's good to know. Uh, by the way, um, right now, Indonesia is uh, still still considered as uh, amber countries. So that means uh, if we are still in amber countries, we must do the quarantine for 10 days. So maybe um, our students want to know uh, if they arrive in uh, Warwick and must do quarantine, could they stay in accommodation during the quarantine time? Yes. So when you look at the grind, the guidelines, amber countries, you can quarantine at home or at your place of residence is what it states. So as a student, your new place of residence would be your accommodation at the University of Warwick. So then you'd be able to quarantine um, at, on campus in your accommodation. So that's typically similar to what students did last year. So students who arrived from abroad last year were able to check into accommodation. Then they quarantined in their rooms. We had a quarantine service set up. So that meant students were able to get food deliveries, um, grocery deliveries and everything to their campus accommodation. So there's a team available to help with that. So even if, and then also during that time period, we also had a lot of online welcome activities. So students were still able to um, attend society meetings. There were also like bedroom party systems as well, where students were engaging virtually, but they're able to experience stuff that everyone else was experiencing. So if the amber list and the green list and the red list still exists by September, that would be looking to be the measures that are put into school students. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, we, we, we really want to be in green countries actually, but still in amber right now. Nah, jadi uh, buat teman-teman dan Bapak Ibu sekalian, uh, saat ini di Inggris sedang menerapkan tiga aturan, yaitu uh, I, uh, country atau negara-negara di uh, di kategori dalam tiga kategori. Yang pertama tuh green country, kemudian kedua amber country, ketiga itu red country. Nah, kebetulan Indonesia saat ini berada di amber country, yang artinya kita tetap harus karantina 10 hari, tapi boleh di mana aja, boleh di akomodasi, akomodasi kampus, boleh di Airbnb, hotel maupun mana aja. Visitor juga boleh masuk. Jadi kalau ada bapak ibu mau antar juga bisa. Kalau green countries itu tanpa karantina. Nah, sedangkan yang uh, benar-benar uh, kategori yang rada sulit untuk masuk ke UK adalah yang red countries. Tapi ya untungnya Indonesia di amber. Nah, kebetulan oleh Warwick uh, Foundation, uh, selama kita karantina, mereka akan benar-benar akan mengawasi dan juga akan membantu soal makanan. delivery food, kemudian semua hal yang berhubungan selama karantina juga akan di-provide. Jadi, nggak usah khawatir soal itu. Uh, sorry, Babs, I, I using Indonesian, bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> so, just in case some of the, they, uh, some of our friends here still confused about uh, what is green country, red countries, and amber countries. Uh, Maybe uh, ada pertanyaan lagi dari ada pertanyaan dari teman-teman sekalian di sini atau bapak ibu yang mau bertanya mungkin? Um, Miss Miss Babs, mm-hmm. is it better to get vaccinated here in Indonesia first or later in the UK? Um, that's kind of a hard question because vaccine vaccines are obviously your own personal choice if you're if you're able to access the vaccine in indonesia then um taking it in indonesia would make it slightly easier for your travel as you're aware that um, a number of airlines for example do want you to be vaccinated before you travel so as it currently stands the uk um would want you to show either a negative pcr test so that would be the test PCR, yeah, PCR is the main test we ask or a vaccination certificate when you're entering in in order to be exempt from some of those quarantine related rules that we mentioned. So as I said before, the government hasn't yet lifted all of our lockdown rules yet. So we're not sure yet on what the requirement will be for September. However, we should know this by July, August as that's the timeline set out for students. 
But if you have access to the vaccine, um, it may be easier for you to do it at home. So our vaccines are given based on ages. So those who are within, you know, 20s to 18 are almost at the lower end of the list. They won't be getting or they won't be invited to vaccines for quite some time. So July, August time. So it may mean that if you were to get vaccinated later here, you wouldn't have access again till maybe October, November, you know, later on in the year. So if you want to avoid the delay of having to wait and you have access at home, you can get it at home. That would be the easiest answer I can give you. It's all based on your own personal choice of which is easier for you. Thank you, Miss. No problem. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Matthew, by the way, uh, he's, he's going to be your student in Foundation Warwick. <laughs> He's okay. just seeing mathematics in there. Oh, okay, that's great. Good to know. Yes. Um, can I ask another question? Yes, please do. Uh, in Warwick, for instance, we can go from math and stats pathway to computer science. But does it apply to other universities? Yes, that does apply to other universities. So one thing that's really interesting about a computer science degree um, is that most computer, the computer science degree for, uh, sorry, the computer science pathway has the same maths modules as our maths and stats pathway. Um, our maths and stats pathway also has a computer science based programming module within it, which is, um, which is in a little less depth than our computer science module. And that's because um, the computer science, uh, the maths and stats department asked um, us to include programming in it. So that's because most computer scientists are actually mathematicians. So you actually need a really high math level to do a computer science degree. So that means you can progress into computer science in Warwick as well as other universities as you have the right level of programming, just the fundamental understanding as well as computer science uh, mathematics understanding as well. So one of the things is with the maths and stats module, you have a programming half course module and you also have an interdisciplinary mathematics module. And that module discusses maths in relation to other academic disciplines. So you'd be looking at maths in relation to computer science, maths in relation to business, physics. So in other study areas. So that's why you're able then to study it, um, study different degree programs from it. So students can go into economics from maths and stats. There's a MORS, which is like an operations I think it's mathematics operations research economics module. I can't remember the last, what the S stands for, but you've got quite a number of modules you can go into. Same would go for some of our computer science students. They can also go into some of the maths related degrees. But maths and stats is the most open module in terms of the degree programs that you can progress into in Warwick and also elsewhere. Okay, thank you, Miss. No problem. Just thinking, is there any other questions? I'm just thinking about um, questions that students may also typically ask. Yeah, right now I think uh, they, some of this, not some, I think most of the students thinking uh, uh, about the vaccine because they saw the information about visitors to enter the European Union, uh, which say that they only accept like certain of vaccine in while in here. We are not used that vaccine yet, so they are worried if it, they won't be allowed to enter UK. But I say that UK already not in the EU. So what do you think? Yeah, so exactly what you just said, and that's what I was going to say. So the UK has left the European Union. So the rules that apply for the European Union do not apply for the UK. So we have our own set rules and guidelines. So if you haven't seen it in our UK guidelines, then um, it wouldn't apply. So currently we have no restrictions on which vaccine a person takes um, that hasn't been outlined in our global, uh, in the government guidelines, sorry. So you could take the vaccine that's in Indonesia or if you were to take it elsewhere, depending on whether you live or you travel elsewhere and take the vaccine, um, essentially, you would need the certification to obviously prove that you've taken it if you were using that in lieu of um, a PCR test, for example. 
So that's the current guidelines. But as again, a lot of this does change um, day by day as we go um, yes. through uh, the different stages of this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and hopefully on 21st of June, there is a good news, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Well, today's the 4th of June. I think it's to be aware that there may be a delay on the 21st of June. Um, but in terms of, because I think it all varies for every country. So in terms of the UK, our main focus has been the deaths, the death rate and our hospitalizations. So continuously our death rate is down. We also had a day where we had no deaths, which was something that we haven't had for a very long time. And then... Um, even our hospitalizations are continually going down as well. So I think now we only have around about 900 people hospitalized out of everyone that's infected, which is a very, very good number. So that's what our main focus is on. So because, um, for example, some people can get vaccinated. I'm sure it's happening in Indonesia and it's happening in other countries where they get vaccinated, but they still get COVID. And that means when they take a test, they count as an infected person, even though they're not going to get sick. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but I'd say for any news you're reading, definitely make sure you're doing your own research and you're reading um, the articles in depth and you're reading multiple sources because sometimes the headline can be shocking, which is what the news is designed for, especially in the West. So, but when you read the article and you understand what they're saying, it's actually not as shocking as the headline said. And <laughs> the same as the like, YouTube videos. They'll give you a shocking title to make you click, but when you listen, it's actually not as terrible. So that's something that we'd encourage students to do, to read through the information for themselves, to make sure that they have a clear um, picture of what's going on. Yes, that's true. Uh, is there anyone to ask to Miss Pubs, maybe? Well, if not, I'm the one who's going to ask you a few questions, actually. Sure. So what do you think? Uh, I mean, how much is uh, the living cost in uh, Warwick? But for foundation, because I know some of our uh, uh, major students tend to spend more. But what do you think? How much is the minimum or usually the, 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 the right uh, amount that they have to spend so the so when you're applying for your visa the uk government does outline um the minimum that it says a student should prepare for every month so i think that's one thousand and twenty five pounds so that to be honest for a student that's usually more than enough one thousand and twenty five pounds um a month that's quite a lot of money because if you're a student you're choosing which type of accommodation you're living in. So that means you could be living somewhere where um, it's 25, uh, 75 pounds a week, or you're going up to 100 pounds a week, all the way to 200 pounds a week. And the good thing about accommodation is it's all on campus, and then that accommodation includes your bills as well. So that's like your TV, everything is included. So you can pay, for example, 500 pounds in your accommodation on campus, and then means if you've stuck to that £1,025, that's still £525 left over. So with that £525, as a student on campus, you walk everywhere. Um, there's a student-free bus as well. So because of our campuses, it typically takes you about, I would say, 20 minutes to walk from your accommodation, depending which one, is on to main campus could be sometimes 15 minutes or you take the quick bus okay. that's well um so that's an option some students choose to get bicycles you can get a bike very cheap that's a quick 80 pounds we also have um what do you call it uh like rentable bikes so you have an app on your phone you can unlock the bike or unlock the electronic scooter and you can take it to whichever building you need to go to you lock it and then the session's over and they're usually about five pence per minute. So typically you'd never need to have a bike for more than 10 minutes. Nothing is that far. <laughs> but you'd okay. literally bike a quick five minutes, which is like 15 pence. And then you'd stop wherever you're going. Um, if you're obviously on Westwood campus, it may take you 
30 minutes to walk around campus, but that's something that all students will be doing. So mm -hmm. it, wise, there's no reason why you're spending really 50 pounds is quite a lot of money if you're spending that in a month for transport. So you've still got, again, 450, 475 pounds left. And that's for your food and your entertainment and, um, you know, your own well-being, your shopping, those types of things. So when it comes to food, if you're cooking at home, um, there's a supermarket right next door to campus and there's also a supermarket on campus. If you're cooking, that's like the normal food, like vegetables, rice, um, meat, those types of things. They're generally cheap. Students can easily, I'd say in a month, spend a minimum of £100 on food. That's your fundamental food. You can easily, as one person, have more than enough with £100 worth of food. Um, if you're eating a lot of takeaway, that okay. does raise the prices up. And um, one of the things about university here is it's supposed to build your independence. So you have to start learning to live by yourself. And that makes it so much better for when you're actually an adult and you move on to different stages of life. But again, if I've taken £100 off, that means you've still got around about £350 for you to go to the cinema, to go to the gym, to do whatever you want. I know there's a gym right next door to campus where per month the membership is £20. So I go to that gym just because it's so cheap. Or you could go to the campus gym if you want to spend more, um, if you want more facilities. Um, sports clubs and society may have a fee of like three or five pounds for you to join in. But again, you would be, it's very rare that I think you'd be spending that four thousand pounds as a student because mm -hmm. you're a lot of time studying um, <laughs> and walking distance. I'd say during vacation periods, that's when you spend more money as that's when you may choose to go to other cities um, or if flying is available, you, from Birmingham Airport, you can actually fly to a lot of other countries quite easily as well. So if that's what you're doing. But on a day to day, that thousand and twenty five, nine, almost, I'd say between 800 pounds and that range would be enough for students to live and have everything that they need. So, yeah, it does vary. Um, students can work during um, vacation periods and also during the program. Um, that's something that the visa does allow. Um, so mm -hmm. it depends if a student wants to just top up a little, you know, £50 pounds or £100 pounds here for shopping or something, they can then work to gain that and gain um, experience as well. But it does vary. It's how much of a spender you are. If you're pretty reasonable, mm -hmm. then you'd be pretty fine with that £1,025. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, usually, I I suggest the the student. The, I knew the minimum is one thousand twenty five pounds, but because uh some not some Indonesian or Indonesian student is not not used with uh, not used to walk because it, it, especially for for student who live in Jakarta because it's not really easy to walk in here. So we tend to use cars or. Uh, not us anymore maybe but uh, more to cars so that's why when I say we, we are walking a lot in there they are thinking oh my god <laughs> but <laughs> it's but not I, it's yeah, not like not, yeah it's not sorry yeah yeah, walking in UK is not making you sweat because it's really cold right and it is really nice not just um, not just it's really cold because it's well, I think because I'm British, then I don't notice how cold it is. But um, walking is just something we do normally. It's very, it's unless you have to go somewhere very far, we never really take a bus or an Uber. It's, we we call it when you're being lazy is when you get a <laughs> or a bus. So the thing about being integrated with British students, which is good for students, is that they will find that their peers will be walking everywhere and it will encourage them to do the same thing so you may be like oh no I need to get a bike or I need to do this but all your friends are walking which changes how it feels but around campus yep yeah, everyone walks you just have to make sure you um, buy some waterproof jackets that's the main thing because we do have variations of rain there's more than one type of rain here <laughs> oh okay 
Nah, jadi teman-teman kalau yang uh, sedang planning atau merencanakan untuk berangkat ke UK di tahun ini maupun tahun depan, uh, biaya atau living cost yang di UK itu memang sudah sesuai yang ditentukan dengan government UK uh, informasi. Jadi diinformasikan sebulan itu kita akan menghabiskan minimum sebesar 1.025 pound sering, di mana itu di dalamnya ada uh, pos untuk bayar akomodasi, pos untuk makan, pos untuk uh, keperluan lain, termasuk transportasi. Tapi karena kebetulan kalau Warwick itu kotanya, uh, areanya semut jangkau, bisa jalan kaki juga, jadi kebanyakan untuk transport nggak terlalu banyak pengeluaran. Uh, mungkin ada teman-teman yang kepengen bawa sepeda sih bisa cuman di sana tadi Miss Pep sudah kasih tahu bahwa ada juga sepeda yang bisa disewa pakai ren yang uh, hmm. berapa menit gitu lima pens gitu jadi nanti kita bisa top, top up aja jadi pakainya se pay as you go jadi kalau kita butuh baru ya kita pakai itu jadi lebih mudah banget uh, terus kalau untuk makan juga sebenarnya banyak restoran-restoran di uh, bukan restoran uh, supermarket dekat kampus jadi kita bisa beli makan uh, bahan pangan di supermarket tersebut terus kemudian masak di dapur yang ada di akomodasi kampus uh, each floor has their own kitchen right so yeah so every, okay. we call it uh, flats is what we say yeah. so every flat has its own um, kitchen Um, which is split either between you and seven other people. In some cases, it's you and five other people. It depends on how big of a flat box you chose. But yeah, okay. your own kitchen where students pick their own cupboard, so their own drawer, they have their own mm-hmm. shelf in the fridge, and you allocate that among your um, flatmates. So you have to be prepared to talk to your flatmates and make sure you interact. so that you can get all of the that sorted out when you first get in. Okay. And also if we bring rice cooker, we can use it in that kitchen, right? Technically. <laughs> okay. So students can have a rice cooker, but it's almost better that you buy it here. Mm-hmm. Uh, because our plugs and adapters are different. So what you tend to find is that if you bring something from Indonesia, you plug it in here and it blows up. So <laughs> not something um, we would recommend. So when you sign your accommodation contract, it's going to list some things you're definitely not allowed to bring. Um, that's because some different dorms are different. Um, but there is an Asian supermarket literally right um, across from the campus. It's about, if I was on Central Campus, I usually walk there in about five, 10 minutes, um, which is very quick, trust me, in a five, 10 minute walk. That's a Korean supermarket, which has rice cookers and um, everything else you kind of want from at least East Asia in the closest vicinity. I know a lot of students do order it online and things of that nature. So we would typically want you to have something that matches our plug systems. And it's better for you that way as well. so that you don't have to call someone because you've blown up the fuse. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, good suggestion. Yeah, because uh, some students are worried uh, they cannot find rice or they, they need to eat rice. So they think to bring the rice cooker in from Indonesia. But actually in, in UK, I believe there are a lot of Asian store who sell like rice in the package and where you can like uh, just pour water and put it in the microwave right and then it's oh, already yeah. Yeah. so so yeah. one thing not to one thing is that rice is actually a really big staple for the UK we eat a lot of rice ourselves so if you okay. go to a normal supermarket most supermarkets have a section where it's um, different culture foods so The rice we eat may be slightly different to the rice you're used to. So you can get all of those. But we have a lot of microwavable rice. I buy a lot of microwavable rice myself. And it's very, very cheap. So nothing to worry there. But then there's also Asian supermarkets um, off campus, like I just mentioned, as well as in the city center. So you can find different nationalities as well. So different areas within Asia who have their own supermarkets where you'll be able to get everything that you pretty much need. That's one thing about the UK is we're very, very international. 
So we have a lot of schools that you can also order stuff to campus, um, like bigger things that you can't get um, in the smaller stores. But yeah, we're very, very international, which is pretty good for most students. Okay. Yes, good. Nah, jadi buat teman-teman yang lagi bingung di sana ada makanan uh, Indonesia, seperti makanan Asia, seperti nasi, nggak usah khawatir. Uh, walaupun daerahnya bukan di kota yang besar, cuman memang udah lengkap banget. Termasuk juga kayak yang tadi saya lagi bicarakan itu adalah mengenai nasi. Uh, mereka bahkan punya yang udah tinggal dikasih air, masukin microwave, itu udah udah dan dan itu memang malah lebih uh, enak banget juga. Jadi nggak usah khawatir mengenai makanan. Uh, mungkin ada yang mau ngasih ide? Pertanyaan apa lagi yang saya mesti tanyakan ke Miss Babs? So Babs, uh, how about bank? Uh, I uh, I knew there are several banks in UK and I knew this maybe some of the uh, brands is in Warwick. Uh, the foundation or the the when the student doing the enrollment, they will get help uh, they will have uh, guidance to opening the bank account right in there um yes so on campus um just by the students union we do have a bank as well um students can also go to the city center to open with different branches so what happens is once you've enrolled at the university typically you be um also getting your brp card as well so that's your bank residency card that's the card that acts as your visa and your proof that you're allowed to be living in the UK which so you carry this card to travel and um, when you register the, for the doctor all those types of things so it's really important you make sure that you get this card delivered to the university campus because when you've enrolled you get your bank letter and typically you'd need the BRP card and your bank letter to go to whichever bank you want to um, open an account with So you have to be aware that this isn't usually a very quick process because banks know that a lot of international students would be joining in September. So they'll ask you to make an appointment and then you'd have to come back typically another day to go through that process. And once you've gone through the process, that's your bank account. They would post you your bank card. So be aware that it can take you a few weeks um, just to finalize the process. But it's important that you're at least getting your BRP card, which is that biometric residence, as I said, that's the most important thing. It's delivered to campus as that can delay your ability to open your account. But yeah, we help you. We have a guideline on our website of how it goes for opening an account. And then as long as you're enrolled, you would then get your bank letter and be able to then start looking at which bank suits you. Okay. I think I think you have some similar, do you guys have HSBC and things like that? I think you guys have a version but, or Barclay. Yes, but, yeah. Uh, we don't have Barclay and I think uh, it it uh, it is actually BC UK in there. So it's a bit Yeah. Yeah. Nah, jadi buat kalau teman-teman yang uh, berpikir untuk buka bank di UK, enggak usah khawatir juga bahwa nanti setelah enrollment atau daftar ulang Uh, kita akan dibantu untuk uh, buka bank di UK. Jadi kita bisa punya bank account di UK, uh, di mana nanti dari Warwick akan memberikan supporting letter untuk buka bank tersebut. Nah, mengenai BRP card yang tadi disebut Miss Babs itu adalah uh, biometric resident permit card. Uh, itu seperti kartu visa, di mana nanti memang setiap student yang masuk ke UK akan mendapatkan BRP card dan BRP card-nya itu akan dikirim oleh government UK UK visa ke Warwick University of Warwick. Jadi teman-teman akan ambil kartu BRP-nya di University of Warwick langsung. Uh, for student who arrive in this September, uh, will you Will you have the welcome week or airport uh, airport pickup uh, again or no? Or do they have to go to the university by their own? So that all depends on the student. So last year, there was an airport pickup service that was run and that was pretty much in the peak of the pandemic. Yeah. So the university usually releases around about August time. 
um, whether there'll be airport pickup and which days students should be then um, booking themselves in for airport pickup. Mm. So as an IFP, we don't run airport pickup. However, the university as a whole does. So students will be able to then book airport pickup um, should that be running again, as it did last year. If not, students can make their way over. Um, I would always say that Birmingham Airport is the easiest um, airport to fly into. You'd usually connect in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and then you'd come um, to Birmingham. If you were to fly into Birmingham Airport, you can get straight out of the airport into a taxi, and in 20 minutes, you're on campus pretty much outside of your accommodation. So 20, 25 minutes if there's traffic a little longer, but you'd be on campus outside of your accommodation. So it all depends on which is the easiest for you. Um, but August time is when you'd start to read about airport pickup. I know that some students want to book.